Thank you for joining us for another Reunited, where our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. My name is Corey Pritchard. Uh, looks like we have Emerson Winfield uh, Jr. on the line. We also have uh, my, my wife, Bridget Pritchard, on the line. And just really excited about uh, moving forward with a, another recording and effective and efficient stewardship in God's kingdom. Uh, this has been a, a tremendous treat for me for a, a number of reasons. And uh, I just really want to make sure uh, that we're taking time tonight. I have a, a number of scriptures in here. So I'm just again, I, I've said this before, but just want to make sure I always reiterate. Uh, it's very important that you, you know, pull the word of God out. If you're able to, again, there are people that are driving in places that you're not able to do that. That's fine. You can go back and revisit the recording. But you want to make sure that you're making time to actually pull the word of God out, pull your Bible out. Right. Make time uh, to be able to read through these scriptures, see them. I'll have them up on the screen, but see them for yourself. Right. Really make sure uh, that you're owning uh, these scriptures. And, and one of the main things I'm realizing is that uh, you may have seen these verses before. Maybe you've seen some of these scriptures before, uh, but rarely have we have we really. Uh, made the time to be able to see them through the, the lenses of Jesus Christ, to be able to see them through the context of the kingdom of God. And I believe it makes all the difference in the world. I, I, I know for a truth that there are people who have read the Bible uh, many times over, right, during their entire lives, and yet still not getting what God intends for them to get out of it, okay? And and I, and I wouldn't say that, that uh, again, my experience is, is totally different than other people, but I would say that it definitely is uh, different in a lot of ways and it keeps getting better and better and better where I believe there's a number of people that have plateaued, right? That they uh, believe that they have received the maximum that they're gonna receive as far as benefit from God. And that's not saying very much, right? And I don't believe that we can really max out God. So again, these opportunities are for us to, to really make a pursuit to be able to, again, see through the eyes of Jesus, eyes of Jesus Christ. Again, he is speaking. He's our king. Right. He's he's sharing with us uh, his his doctrine. Right. So if we're looking at the doctrine of Jesus Christ, then we are also seeing and hearing the doctrine of God. Uh, we also have the privilege and opportunity to be able to, to hear the commands of Jesus Christ. If we really understand uh, what it is uh, that we're receiving, we are being commanded. Right. And it's a powerful thing. And it's not an, an, from a, a, a negative standpoint. It is a privilege to see this as a command. Why? Because our king would never command us to do something that's harmful, that's hurtful and detrimental to our health. It's always for our benefit. Right. And we, if we see those things the way that I believe that God intends for us to see them, then then those things will begin to manifest for us. OK, so again, uh, uh, with that being said, uh, I always recommend, you know, going through at least two times, right? Listening to it at least live uh, and then going back through a second time or going through it twice if you're listening to the recording. Uh, it's just a, a powerful thing. And at, as of right now, that has been something that I've been doing. I actually go back and listen to some of the older messages and I'm really uh, pleased uh, by what I'm getting out of that information. Again, as I'm going through this detoxing infra, uh, uh, kind of process, and when I say detoxing, sometimes you don't realize how much religion and wrong doctrines and those types of things are in you until later on down the line, right? And you can go back and revisit some, you know, some things that you listen to. You're like, man, I never heard that before, right? You've listened to the same thing once or twice, but then you hear it again, uh, again, being able to, to 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 digest or take in something in a different way. You're like, wow, I never heard that before. So I myself go back and revisit a, a number of messages. And again, I'm still very uh, blessed by those. So I encourage that, that we all do that. So with that being said, uh, what I want to do is just again, and I, I asked Emerson before we actually began the recording, but I want to make sure I give any opportunity only because I'm recognizing uh, that Emerson, uh, he's been sharing some things with me as far as uh, his growth and, and the things he's been learning about the kingdom of God. He's also had the privilege and opportunity to be able to share uh, with a group of, of, uh, of individuals, and that's been blessing him. And uh, he's he's mentioned uh, that uh, Greg Grice has, has been there. He's, he's been so uh, blessed by the things that the brother uh, Greg G has been saying uh, in that setting and the things that he's been saying. So again, I want to make sure that I give an opportunity. My wife is actually on here. Again, I'm not sure if she's able to or wants to say anything. But before we move forward, I do want to make sure I give those opportunities. So is there anything that any uh, any of you would like to share uh, maybe about your experience and, and learn about the kingdom of God, about things in general, as far as life goes, what you're learning, just anything you'd like to share before we move forward tonight?
I don't I don't have anything right now. Okay. Also just want to again double check. Thanks for your feedback. Anybody else? No, I'm good at right at the moment, uh, Corey. Thank you very much for the space. So I'm good at the moment though. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh you you good too, brother Greg G. Hey, brother, uh sister Bridget, uh, Minister Winfield. No, I'm just glad to be uh able to join tonight been busy been busy 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 a lot of stuff going on and i'm just just excited to be here tonight and looking forward to what the lord is about to do just want to send greetings out to everyone that's it awesome thank you and it's so glad to have you i've been hearing so many great things about you you just man you've been <laughs> one that that gets uh we we get very excited uh, about you i think you and my wife you talk about you know some people uh, so we get excited about the idea of people growing and maturing, you know, spiritually and things working for them in general. Uh, but then there are certain people, you know, like Emerson, like you, like you, uh, brother Greg G, that, you know, we just seem like we get even more excited, you know, so uh, to know uh, about your growth and, and some things that are moving. Again, you know, Emerson tells me, you know, how blessed he is by some of the things he, that, that you're sharing and just things that are, that are working for you. Man, we're just so excited for you. So thank you so much for joining. We're so happy to have you. And this will be a great session. I'm excited to get the, uh, again, the input uh, as you feel led to be able to share. Uh, but this will be a blessed time uh, for, for all of us, right? I, I expect to, to receive too, right? So I'm not just, you know, sharing. I, I, I know as a matter of truth that I will be receiving uh, as we're going through this. So I really appreciate it. So again, we're going to go ahead and move forward. So the first scripture, and we revisited this, I don't think it can be done enough. Again, just setting the foundation and setting the stage. The first scripture I'd like for us to visit is, is in Luke chapter 12, verse 42. And again, we've seen this. I brought this scripture up, you know, many times. Uh, but but as we're looking at this, this is something, again, that I have to echo. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm having it echo you know, to me and I'm going to echo it to you. But when I'm reading the Bible, then one thing I had to realize and this is this is something I'm just going to tell you exactly the way I got it. God never asked me to be a Bible scholar. And I'm sitting, you know, just just kind of blown away by, by the statement as I receive it. And I was never asked to be a Bible expert. Right. And I'm thinking, what, what does that mean? You know, so I, I'm, I'm sitting and I'm trying to make sure I can I can gather the rest of that. The reality is, is that we we have the privilege and opportunity to have what we, we you know, what we have called the canonized Bible. So thank God for the Torah. Right. Thank God for what you know, uh, Moses was able to be able to share that we have access to. Thank God you know, for what the prophets were being able to share. Thank God for all those things. Thank God for the revelation uh, that Paul was able to give and, and, and writing to the different churches and addressing the problems that, that people was having. Thank God for all of it. But, but the challenge is, is that we have lost our focus on Jesus Christ, not, not on the person of Jesus Christ, but on the teaching, right, of Jesus Christ. And my wife brought a scripture to mind and actually I'll go ahead and flip to it. You know, I didn't actually have this on my, uh, my radar for today but go ahead and go to matthew chapter 24 and we're going to go right right to the end of the uh of the chapter and this is the thing and i actually had to go back through myself and actually start looking at these last remarks that jesus christ is actually giving to the disciples as he's actually leaving and it's amazing because each book is 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 totally different you know in some books there is no command right right at the end as he's leaving it doesn't give them a command of what to do and 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 then the other commands then there is something to do, but it's not necessarily what you would think, right? So it's amazing. So when you go to uh, Matthew and look at that that last chapter, ver uh, chapter 28, and I'm going to read uh, 18 through, through 20, and I want you to see this, okay? Because when my wife had this revelation and she just pointed it out, I'm like, whoa, right? <laughs> One of many things that, we, that we've missed, but it says here, beginning in 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth right not not too profound okay we we should accept that if we really really understand what they're saying we're connected to the one who has all power in heaven and earth okay we know that let's look at 19 it says as a command right when we understand we are in a kingdom we are citizens and he is giving commands because he's our king he says, go ye therefore as a command and teach what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father 
in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, here in 20, as a command, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Do you see that? And I said, my goodness, how the heck did I miss that? That's what my wife pointed out is verse 20. Again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. As a promise, right? So again, as I'm looking at that, I say, man, I'm thankful for everything else that we have been given. But the reality is, is that this early church in Acts that we read about, that those people, they didn't have the writings of Paul, right? And in many cases, they may have been put out of the temple, maybe put out of the synagogue. So they really didn't have access to that as much. So they were really looking forward to the teachings of the disciples as they came. Why? Because they're hearing the teachings of Jesus Christ. They're hearing the commands and commandments of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? They're getting the principles of the kingdom of God that they were given to pass on. And when Paul is out talking to the Gentiles, right, because that's the ministry he was given, Paul wasn't trying to convince them to go and be a, a, a Jew, right, a religious Jew. That wasn't what he was trying to convince them. He wasn't trying to go and teach them the Torah, right, which, we, which he was an expert in and could have and qualified to do it. He wasn't doing that. What was he doing? He was teaching them the command, commands of Jesus Christ, teaching them the teaching of Jesus Christ, which is, again, what 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 jesus actually has commanded the disciples and how much better are the results for those who had that foundation right laid in jesus christ the teachings of jesus christ the doctrines of jesus christ all those things first so that when they're hearing the writing or, or hearing the teaching of, of paul about certain subjects he was addressing or they're actually hearing the preaching of Paul. Now they've had this foundation on Jesus Christ and his teaching and his doctrine. Now they can correctly hear what Paul is truly trying to convey. I hope that makes sense. So when we're looking at this, then it's very important to be able to, again, make our attempt to ask the Holy Ghost to help us to be able to see, again, in the correct context. And I truly believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom it is the context that God desires us to be able to see through, okay? So looking at Luke, chapter 12 verse number 42 and it reads and the lord said who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season right and this 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 verse is loaded and packed so we're not trying to unpack all of that all at once it's just trying to get what we need to get as we're moving forward through these weeks so the one or two things I've, I've pointed out in the weeks past, one is faithful, right? The importance of these qualities to be found in a steward. First of all, to identify ourselves as a steward, right? And I remember I uh, had a, a recent conversation with Emerson and talking about the importance of identification. And it's sad that most people that have confessed hope and faith in Jesus Christ would not identify themselves as being a citizen of the kingdom of God, would not actually have any association with that and couldn't tell anybody about any command of Jesus Christ, even though he says to teach them my commandments, right? Many, many of us would not even have any idea. So we are not identifying ourselves in the way that God truly uh, uh, acts and desires for us to identify ourselves. So this faithfulness is a very key thing, right? Being a steward, seeing myself, do I see myself as a steward, right? Jesus Christ says again in Matthew 28 and 18 that he has been given all power in heaven and in earth, right? And we saw other scriptures says that everything was made by him and for him, right? You and I were made by him and for him. So everything, right? In heaven, right? In earth right all the galaxies all the planets everything that it encompasses all are owned by him right does that make sense so we're not trying to get ownership when we start to get the idea i don't have the pressure of having to be owner that ain't the pressure my responsibility is to have my correct alignment and to accept the identity that god has given me and one of those things is to be a steward he owns it, right? I don't got that pressure. My thing is to be what? Faithful. <laughs> God is asking me to be faithful. He's not asking me to be an owner. He's asking me to identify myself as being a steward and to see myself as faithful, 
ask the Holy Spirit to help me to get in alignment with God's idea of being faithful and also to understand that Jesus Christ is our wisdom. Right. We talked about that. But do we really see him? as being this high wisdom right and i hear a number of people still wanting to make reference of people such as solomon i thank god for solomon right but jesus christ said one greater has come <laughs> right so if we're going to pay attention to the so-called wisdom that solomon gave or david gave which is awesome then understand how much higher the wisdom that, that that god has established in his son which is jesus christ and shouldn't we much more pay attention to that right so the wisdom that God is asking us to grow up in is not the wisdom of the world. Yes, we can read books and, you know, go to seminars and all those types of things. But again, we must understand how much higher these things are in Jesus Christ that we have. So he's asking us again, have this quality. It is an expectation that we see ourselves as stewards, that we be found faithful in the eyes of God and the way he views faithful faithfulness and to be able to walk in the wisdom that he has given to us in order for us to fully function as the steward that God desired. I hope that makes sense. And why? Because God wants us to be these rulers, right? He, he has this household that he's expecting the stewards to raise up to be made rulers over. Why? So that we can distribute this portion of meat in due season does that make sense now the, the the challenge is if we're not identifying ourselves correctly and we don't have these characteristics then why in the world would god allow us to be these rulers in his household knowing that we're going to beat the maid service and men service right we've seen a parable that talks about that that don't make sense knowing that we're going to uh, misuse the the resources that god has provided knowing that we're going to ignore all the high things in Jesus Christ that he wants us to be able to distribute and walk in, mm -mm, right? So much uh, uh, is given, much is required. We talked about that. He who has, right, will be given more. <laughs> and the one who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken. These are all principles and laws that function in God's kingdom. And again, when we begin to walk in these things and identify ourselves correctly like we should, and have these characteristics that be able to manifest in our lives, I truly believe it's going to be some of the most incredible things that the world has ever seen in history, right? Not, not I'm talking about uh, uh, even beyond what has been seen in the first church, okay? If we would, again, start, start to align with the things that God is truly saying, I hope that makes sense. Let me read this, this next scripture that aligns with that one, and then I'll pause. And again, to echo that, the next one is found in Matthew 24 and 45, again, just just stated from another perspective by another disciple okay but who then is a faithful and wise servant okay do you see that and again that servant and steward they are connected okay so it's still talking about the same char characteristic and the way that god identifies us and the way we should identify ourselves but you see this faithfulness right and this quality of being wise and it says again who his lord hath made ruler over his household that's that's his desire he wants that to happen right the stewardship the faithfulness the the the, the servant uh ship the the wisdom all of these things are for us to be rulers in his household so that we can do what he desired us to do which is to give them their meat in due season i hope that makes sense okay so let me pause any comments any questions anything is this making sense where we're, we're you know kind of kind of headed to all right all right you, you gonna say something no i was just saying yeah it makes sense okay okay thank you so much i appreciate it and again we're gonna move forward just just locking in just keeping keeping staying in this lane okay so here's the note uh that i had on the in, in the back of that that i'm asking what slash who is our model of effective and efficient stewardship in god's kingdom okay because i've given some examples we went to the old testament and we, and we pulled up you know some some pretty decent examples obviously one bad example but a couple pretty decent examples in the old testament but god's not asking me to make them my high mark okay or my aim now can i gather some things that's helpful to, from them oh absolutely but if his high mark or aim were in them or anyone else, then why would his son need to come? 
right? Why would Jesus Christ need to come and spend three years in ministry? Maybe longer, right? Maybe a little bit longer, but why would he need to spend that amount of time in ministry doing the work, speaking the words, right? Giving commands, giving judgments, giving, giving, giving these things, doing all the wonderful miracles. Why, if it wasn't necessary, right? So what I'm suggesting is, is that uh, this perfect model is Jesus Christ, which is what? Our Lord, which is our owner and our master, right? He is our king, right? Capital K-I-N-G. And he is our savior, right? Of many other things, but he is at least that. Okay. So I'm asking that we take a look at Luke chapter six. Okay. And I'll give you a moment to get there. And it's going to be Luke chapter six. And this is verse number 40. And again, any, any time, if you, if you have anything to say or any questions, then again, unmute yourself and make sure you do that. Okay. So in Luke chapter six, verse number 40, the disciple is not above his master. Okay. Now I'm going to make sure that I pulled out again. I like to do that. The, 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 the one version in Luke and also the other version in Matthew. Okay. I'm, I'm going to make sure we see, we see that, but I want to make sure I can do my best to try to paint it the way that the God is, is, is trying to paint it to me. Okay. Hopefully it's much clearer to you. <laughs> right. But I'm going to do my best to try to convey that because I'd never seen it that way. And I haven't heard anybody really talk about it this way. Okay. So let's look at it. The disciple is not above his master. Okay. You see that? But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Do you see that? Okay. And again, very, very specific. Okay. Very direct. These are the words of our king. Very specific wording. He does not waste words. Okay. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 10. Okay. And it's going to be verses 24 through 25. And again, I'm going to pause. And, and the reality is, is, is I recognize that, again, we're here live, but there are a number of people who will hear this recording, many more than I actually hear. So as you're listening to this, I want you to really, you know, do your best. Again, get into your Bible. If you have a journal, pull your journal out, right? Write down some questions, some notes that you have. You can play, you can pause this, you can rewind it, you can do that. But own this, right? Own this information. I'm just doing my best to be able to share, but allow the Holy Spirit, you can pause right now and say, Holy Spirit, reveal your kingdom to me, right? Help me to be able to see your kingdom the way that Jesus Christ desired for me to see it. Help me, Holy Ghost, to be able to uh, uh, to really own this. And you give me revelation beyond what Corey's saying, right? Corey's doing his best, right? But I know, Holy Spirit, that there's so much more that you would like to unlock and reveal to me. So Holy Spirit, can you please teach me? right? Share with me. Unpack these verses to me, right? So that I can own this information, allow it to be able to uh, be uh, applicable, right? And, and, and to work on the inside of me so that I have application, right? And I'm saying that in a way because we have many customs and traditions that allow us to be comfortable with no manifestation, right? So we can read the word of God, come into an experience maybe with you know an event or a setting and and we have a feeling right tickly feeling right some 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 ooh ah but it don't change us right so that i'm still going out and doing the same things i was doing i'm still having the same experiences i was having in life and i still have the same amount of power functioning through me that i had before which for many of us little many of us is little to none but these words they are life and they are spirit. So they should change us if that makes sense. So again, I'm asking you to do what you have to do on your end to make sure it allows the spirit of God to have permission to move in the way that he already wants to move anyways. But will we allow him to? Hope that makes sense. OK, so again, in Matthew's account. Chapter number 10, verses 24 and 25, the disciple is not above his master all. Oh, Thank you, God. Nor the servant above his Lord. Come on now. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master the house of Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? You see that household again, right? So understand that 
as we are coming into 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 God's kingdom, right? We're coming into God's kingdom. Then the expectation is is that we become like our master. Does that make sense? So when when the men called Jesus Rabboni, when they called him Rabbi, then they were calling him master, right? You are the teacher. And the expectation is is that the person would begin the process of becoming identical to the rabbi. Does that make sense? This is the expectation when they came into discipleship is they knew that their expectation was to be like the master. That's the expectation. Now, for many of us, we haven't had that experience. So we believe that we can keep all of our own old proclivities, all of our own ways of doing things. We want to have our own flavor of being able to share the word of God and have our own kind of twist on everything. And I want to keep all my own everything. When the, when the, when the expectation should be is that I am a learner as a disciple of who Jesus Christ. Now we may be learners, but are we learners of Jesus Christ exclusively? If that makes sense. Am I a learner of his doctrine? Am I a learner of his teachings, right? Am I a learner of his commands and commandments? Am I a learner of his ways of doing things? Does that make sense? So when we're looking at this, the, the vitalness of understanding what Jesus Christ is saying, he's saying as a disciple, the job that you have is to be like me. <laughs> I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to have my eyes so fixed on and aimed in Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm thankful for these other examples. Thank God for him. But my aim and focus is on the king. So my, my, my responsibility is allow the Holy Spirit to bring me into alignment again. As a spirit being, I'm already identical to Christ. I understand that. But my soul, right? Our souls need some reconditioning, need some sanctification, need some help that can only happen by the words of Jesus Christ and by bringing ourselves into the presence of the Holy Spirit. So it should be a case where not only am I identical to Christ as a spirit man, is that I should be identical to Jesus as a, as a, as a soulish, right? In, in my soulish man, right? And then that should pour out into my physical body where people say, man, I don't know what Jesus looked like, but based on the words that I'm reading, I would say you look, he looks a lot like you, right? And I think there's a reason why we can't find any real tangible scriptures to really describe the look of Jesus Christ. I believe that, that I believe there's a reason why it's not an accident or a happenstance. And it's because he wants us to focus on the more important things, the higher things, right? And it is the, the, the soul, right? And it is the spirit that's worked out. And yes, the physical body, man, could have been dark, right? Could have been dark brown, light brown. I don't know. Could have had long hair, short hair. I don't know, right? But those things are not the more important things, yet men want to focus on those things. But again, our responsibility is to be like our master, okay? And it says, nor the servant above his Lord. So we are being made like him. Not to be low, much lower, not to, to have an, an idea of, of, of being much higher. We want to be as our Lord, okay? It says it's not enough for the disciple that he be uh, as his master, and then the servant as his Lord, right? And we are called to, again, be like him. This is our model of perfection. There's another scripture that, that, that says it that way, that if you want to measure perfection in your life, then the measure of perfection is how close, how identical am I to my master, to my rabbi, to Jesus Christ? That's my measure. Isn't that crazy, right? And that is the, me that is the measure of a disciple is how identical are we am i walking like him and i am i talking like him right am i preaching what he preached am i teaching what he taught do i have the demonstration that he had am i am i am i am i, am I do i have the uh again this faithfulness in the way that he demonstrated faith faithfulness and and, and the newest command okay uh, is the reality that we are not just called to love others as we want to be loved but the higher thing is to love others as he loved us isn't that, isn't that awesome? So we have to have an experience with his love in order to be able to model that love, right? All these things, again, just, just very, very important and being tied into that to, to those verses, okay? Uh, any, any comments, any questions, anything before I get into a couple of these notes as we move forward? I 
All right, just going to keep moving forward then. Go ahead and take a look at Matthew chapter 17, and this is going to be verses 24 through 27. Just, 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 just keeps getting really good. Just, just really, really excited about all of this. Okay. Again, pausing to make sure you have an opportunity uh, to be able to, to get there. Okay. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. Okay. So here's my note before we actually read that scripture measuring ourselves against our model okay that that's that's what those scriptures that i read above that's what it says to me is that i'm i'm not measuring myself against the the, the big name whoever it is or the little name whoever it is that they're not they're not my measure right i'm thankful for a sermon that you may have shared i'm, I'm i appreciate the revelation that you gave me but listen you're not my measurement you're not my model so we measure ourselves against our model which is in Jesus Christ. Anybody have something to say? Okay. And then when you do, just let me know. How would our father rate our stewardship was my question. Again, based on the model, right, which is Jesus Christ that we're measured against, how would he, our father, rate our stewardship? Does that make sense? Okay. Again, we must at first identify ourselves as a steward. Most of us have not done that. But then how would he rate us based on his expectation for us, based on our effectiveness and efficiency, right? How would he rate us? Was Jesus Christ effective was my question, okay? Was Jesus Christ efficient, right? Has there ever been a more effective and efficient person? I don't believe there has been. With only three years of recorded ministry, the entire world, the cosmos, the system, and the people have been revolutionized. And I said infinitely, right? Because that continues to go on, right? As spirit beings, we don't end. So the impact that Jesus Christ has had on each and every one of us, that continues to go for an infinite amount of time, right? So I'm asking that we take a look at a few examples, okay? So the first example that I'm asking that we look at Again, it's found in there in Matthew chapter 24 through uh, uh, chapter, about that chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. Okay, let's read that. And when they came, when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? (laughs) Right? He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Right? Very good question, right? And it's interesting if you have time, I would highly encourage that you spend some time right in that space, right, to really unpack what it is that Jesus is trying to convey with this question. It's a powerful question. And I think, and again, I could be wrong, but I really, really strongly think that it is nearly impossible. I was going to say impossible. I believe it's nearly impossible to accurately be able to unpack what Jesus Christ is trying to convey outside of a kingdom mindset, outside of a kingdom concept context it does not make any sense but it's a powerful thing that he's trying to convey okay so i'll continue on and peter said unto him of strangers right and jesus response is amazing jesus said unto him then are the children free (laughs) so again when you understand what he's trying to convey the question is a powerful question notwithstanding right lest we should offend them Go ye to the sea. He's talking to, you know, the disciple. He's telling Peter, or he calls him Simon also. Go to the sea, cast and hook. And he says, take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, right? And if you look at the English Standard Versions, I know that that's one version, possibly the Amplified and maybe a couple other versions. It actually tells you uh, the amount of money, okay? that the that the collector was looking to collect and then also tells you the amount of money that was actually taken up by the fish but it says you find this piece of money and he says that take and give unto them uh for me and for thee 
Uh, any comments, any questions? Somebody have something? Okay. So I just want to make sure again, just, 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 just really understanding what's going on here. Okay. So again, as you look deeper into what Jesus Christ is saying, Jesus is the King, right? That's a reality. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew Israelites, that's what they were dealing with. They were expecting a king to come like David, and they were expecting a kingdom to come like this original uh, kingdom of Israel. So they were looking for a kingdom. Oh, absolutely. Not looking for a spiritual kingdom, but they were looking for a kingdom. And they were looking for a king. Oh, absolutely. They were not looking for a king to come in a manger. Wasn't looking for a king not to come with the army the way that they would normally expect to have an army and not coming in peace and showing grace and mercy but coming with a sword, but they were looking for king. Does that make sense? So Jesus Christ is exposing the reality that these individuals, they don't collect no tribute from other kings, <laughs> right? Nor their children. But how is it, right? They're going to come collecting it for me. I'm a king. I have a kingdom, but they're going to come collecting it for me, right? So he says, no big deal. Not to offend them, Let's go ahead and pay the tribute. So as he again, he sends uh, uh, Peter or Simon down to down to collect uh, this this sum of money so that he can go ahead and pay that. Right, it's a powerful thing. Okay, so here's the note. My question was, how was Jesus effective? Now pay attention to what I'm saying. When I say effectiveness, is did he hit his target? Okay, and the example that that I start you know rehearsing in my mind, not for this, but just trying to get my mind more around wrapping around what is effectiveness and what does that look like what is efficiency and what does it look like so you can have two cars right one is barely uh sticking together right it is it's i mean it's barely running but it gets you from a to b some people call these cars beaters right i think all of us are either driving one or had one of these beaters at some point right and and it's, it's wonderful it's better than having no car right so some cars better than no car and and what is the the uh the main uh, purpose of a vehicle it is to get you from a to b right does that make sense can it get you from a to b so if you have a beater the beater is effective right it is it gets you from a to b but then the challenge is if you have this beater and sometimes you get there on time because maybe you know something fell off or stopped working right uh, or, or, you know, it's just not very reliable. Maybe it's a car or, or a vehicle that consumes a tremendous amount of gas. So you have to put a, a ton of money into the car, not just in repairs, but also in, in gas. It'll get you there, but you got to spend a lot of money. And so you got this time wasted. You got this money wasted, right? So it is effective. Does that make sense? It's going to get you there. But then is it efficient? And if it is, how efficient is it? So many of us have prayer lives that are not very effective we do a lot but is it hitting the target and producing the result maybe not and then for some of us it may be working sometimes but then is it efficient and then if it is efficient how efficient is it again in comparison to the results that jesus christ is getting and this is our model not to make you feel bad or make anybody feel bad but this is the reality we deal with why because he's our high mark he's expecting us to do the works that he did even greater works than he did this is our high mark and expectation again. So again, was Jesus effective looking at this passage? And I asked, how do we know? Jesus was given a problem and he provided a solution, meaning he was effective. Does that make sense? I asked, did Jesus provide a solution? Now think about what I'm asking, directly or indirectly, okay? Now directly, is the way that we would normally look at it. Want to see how much money I got in my pocket, right? I'm gonna dig in my pocket and I'm gonna pay it, right? So I dealt with it directly. And I believe that, you know, that's a possibility that that that, that could have happened. But the reality is that Jesus didn't deal with it directly. He dealt with it indirectly. Isn't that a powerful thing? Okay, to see how, how he chose to deal with this situation. Jesus provided his, his, his disciple with the word of wisdom okay and that word of wisdom that i'm speaking of is found in, in first corinthians chapter two, chapter 12 and in and, uh, and, and, uh, uh verse number eight right this is a quality among many things word of knowledge word of wisdom right we got healing miracles right uh discerning of spirits right we have divers tongues interpretation of tongues we have all these different gifts and the reality is if we look at jesus christ in his life then we will find these gifts. The only one that you won't find that I won't find is probably the interpretation of tongues and divers tongues. And why is that? 
who else is speaking in tongues? <laughs> right. So we don't know what that looked like out he's as he's on the mountain, but you'll find every other gift functioning operating in the ministry of Jesus. And what we see here is 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 this functioning of the word of wisdom. Okay. And again, we see this this wisdom as a steward that we should function. And you're like, whoa, let me look at the model, right? The steward, my example, a perfect model in stewardship and see how he functions in wisdom. It's a powerful thing to see how he has this wisdom to work to solve this problem. OK, and again, revisit that or visit that. But I'm sharing again that he is functioning in word of wisdom that that was needed to satisfy the financial obligation for himself and the disciple isn't that powerful to see how he did that so again i'm asking was this solution effective did it hit the target and i'm saying oh absolutely it hit the target right so jesus christ absolutely in this instance effective right and i'm saying yes he was also efficient okay and the right the way i'm looking at this efficiency was there any waste right when you look at the definition of efficiency was there any waste and then how much waste was there okay and again was there any waste and i asked how much was it so the collector he requested two drachma okay this is a form of currency that they used at the time so when he's coming to the the uh, jesus christ and coming to peter then he says as a tribute okay they were building something then your part of the tribute is to pay two drachma okay so two for you two for you right that's four drachma so the disciple retrieved when he went to the water from the fish's mouth he got one shekel that this is, this is awesome when you see how this works out because how much is a shekel right what is the value of a shekel in their times so a shekel is exactly two drachma right actually sorry about that one shekel is actually worth four drachma okay let me make sure i correct that so you have the disciple that goes down to the water and he pulls this fish out of the water digs in his mouth finds a coin and it happens to be a shekel which is exactly the amount that they both needed do you think that was an accident right so my question was why didn't jesus command the disciple to retrieve 10 coins right or 20 coins right now you think about this word of wisdom that jesus operating in if he's able to do that and we would we would we'd be like oh it's on then right so jesus christ made a fish and atm right we just not gonna go in and go get this ten dollars we like let it roll right keep printing it keep printing it let it come they let it keep coming and it's a powerful thing to see the integrity of jesus christ the discipline of jesus christ obviously the wisdom of jesus christ okay but we see that jesus christ even though he could have asked him to go down and and collect probably an uncountable amount of coins from 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 these fishes that were in the water he didn't okay so look at this he absolutely did not need it isn't that crazy so only the only thing he asked for was what they actually needed how many hours did jesus exchange in labor right isn't that a powerful thing to think about what this word of wisdom the value that it actually has because it probably would have took a whole day's uh, worth of work in order for someone to be able to to, to receive uh, this amount of money, right? What not what that wasn't necessary. Okay, again, wasn't any waste of time. Wasn't any waste of money. I'm asking, was there any waste in time? No, wasn't no waste in time, right? Here's a problem. Here's a solution. Solved just like that. This is our perfect model for what rich and richness. So our idea of what being rich or what richness is, it's all messed up. If we don't keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ as our aim, again, our model, and let him establish what rich and richness looks like, we're going to be all messed up, right? And a lot of times that's exactly what we have happened. We have other people trying to tell us what rich looks like instead of focusing on what Jesus Christ looked like, okay? So I'm saying he owns everything, right? Owning everything yet appearing to own nothing right no waste so jesus christ again extremely effective extremely efficient owning everything could have packed around all the stuff that we want to act like we want to do to show people how much money we got right could have had all these uh chariots and, and robes had money bags loaded with gold and silver clanging as he's walking right could have did all of that yet he didn't 
All right. Is that an accident? I know people to try to paint a picture of a broke Jesus. Jesus wasn't broke. OK, but Jesus is Jesus is model of what rich is and richness is, is, is very different than the way we look at it. OK, again, no waste. <laughs> right. Very efficient and very effective. Any comments, any questions before before we look at this next scripture? Is this is this uh, something again? Any disagreement? Any agreement? Is this is this making sense? All right. Well, I'll continue on again. You feel free to unmute yourself um, as you need to, or feel feel like you would like to say something. Let's look at Matthew chapter twenty eight, verse number eighteen. Stand just right in that lane, right? Looking at our model, looking at the example. And I'm looking at, uh, again, Matthew 28, verse 18. And it reads, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, again, I, I read this early on, but, but focus on this. Pay attention to what, what's going on here. Now, again, Jesus Christ is coming to the world, born of a virgin, right? You have these kings that, that came to him and brought him all of these gifts, spent his life, you know, doing all these things, raised up. Uh, his parents, you know, uh, were, were, were thought he was traveling with them, but he was spending time in the temple actually teaching. Right. As a child, you know, goes through this life, whatever that life looks like, you know, as a as a as a, as a young man, a child uh, before being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Baptized by John. And then the, the Holy Spirit comes on him like a dove. Right. And actually indwells him, which is a powerful thing to come on uh, to even consider. That happens. He's led out into the wilderness and then comes out of the wilderness being tempted 40 days by the adversary and says what? Repent. <laughs> right. Says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing he commands is to repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is here. It is at hand. OK, so he says that spends these time in ministry, I believe, is nearly three years in ministry crucified. Right. He has given his life, not as his life is not taken his life. He's given his life as a sacrifice to atone for the sin and to accomplish all the things that the that the, the prophets had, had prophesied. It's a powerful thing when we understand when it says that the law and the prophets were fulfilled. Then it's the case when you look at the Mosaic law and you look at everything that's established there. He's the fulfillment of that. OK, he's the fulfillment of all these uh, uh, moral standards that men could not meet he's a he's a fulfillment of all the atonement that was required for sin all the prophets were speaking of jesus christ he says look at the prophets they speaking to me right so it's all pointing to jesus christ so in, in in this part of his his life then he's already been crucified he's already risen right shown himself to his disciples he's headed back to the right hand of the father to sit on the right hand of the father and this is one of the last statements that he that he actually you know uh, makes and some of the last statements that are made and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, "What all power, <laughs> all? What does that mean? All, right? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. There ain't no question about that. Okay. So when we're looking at this, here's my notes. If you were assigned the task of feeding thousands of people, my question is, would you lead them out into a deserted place to feed them? Think about what I'm saying." It is your task. You got thousands of people that need to be fed. Would you take them out intentionally into a wilderness, a deserted place in order to feed them? Right. I wouldn't say the most men would. Away from all sources of food. Does that make any sense? Right. Does that make sense? I'm saying no. Don't make any sense. No, it does not make practical sense, but it does make faith. OK, I'm saying it don't make sense, but it makes faith. OK, the nation of Israel was led out into the wilderness shortly after becoming financially rich, spoiling the Egyptians. Right. One moment a slave, next moment, filthy rich. That's just the reality of it. they spoiled them without war. Right. Taking out gold and jewelry and all types of clothing, packing it right out into the wilderness. Challenge is where are you going to spend it at? <laughs> so God sends them out into the wilderness. You can't even spend it. Ain't never had no money before. Ain't never owned anything. And you would love to be able to spend it all. Ain't nowhere to spend it. Right. So God intentionally takes them out into the wilderness where ain't no food, ain't no resources. Right. Why? Because now they are forced to depend on him. So, again, my question is, 
if your responsibility is to feed thousands of people, would you take them out into the wilderness? An even higher question is, if your responsibility was to take care of millions of people, would you take them out into the wilderness? I would say no. Most of us would never even think about doing such a thing. Again, who leads a multitude of people out into the wilderness to feed them? God. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? God does. He provided for millions of people over 40 years in the wilderness without the use of money or any other tangible currency, right? So let's look at, again, Jesus Christ, our model, and we'll actually end uh, with this, okay? Go to Matthew chapter 14, and let's look at verses 13 through 21, right? This, this is absolutely phenomenal. When we understand, again, having access to everything right and what does he do with the resources what does he do with the grace and the mercy that he has right that he's a steward steward of what does he have uh as, as as far as the mysteries that he has access to and how does he steward the mysteries of the kingdom and the mysteries that god has put into his care how does he steward all this great abundant things that god has put into his care right so beginning at verse number 13 when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by the ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when he was when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, this is a desert place, right? Now, again, sometimes we think that this stuff is a happenstance. Jesus knew that these people would follow him. So if he knew that they were going to follow him, it would seem like, again, if, if, he, if he didn't have the ability and the desire to be able to provide for them, he would have led them into a place that was near, near a city. But he didn't, right? So, again, there, he, they remind him, hey, we're in a desert place. And the time is now past, okay? They're saying, hey, it's getting late. Whatever time is required for them to be able to get back into a city or near a city, he said, hey, that's just about past, okay? So it says, send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victual. Don't that make head knowledge sense? Don't make faith, but it makes head knowledge sense. It makes sense. You got all these people out here. They hungry, right? They thirsty. It's going to take them at least whatever amount of time to be able to get to where they're trying to get to. Go on and send them home, right? Send them home. You didn't heal them. You didn't taught them. Send them home, right? I know they're going to be hungry in the way, but send them out to these places where they can go buy, uh, again, uh, for themselves with money, right? Again, trying to make money a solution. Money is not a solution to everything, okay, whether we want to believe it or not, but send them out so they can so they can use the solution they've been using, which is money, to, to solve this problem, okay? Let's see if Jesus' take on it is. And Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, <laughs> right? Hold on, hold on, right? Now, we're in the wilderness, we're in the desert. Ain't no food, ain't nothing around here. Disciples looking around at each other like, I ain't got no food. I don't know how this is going to work out. But he says to them, they need not depart. So this has to be absolutely perplexing, right? Give ye to them. So not only does he say they don't need to depart, he could have said, I'll take care of them, which they would have had a better opportunity to be able to digest and accept. But he's audacious enough to say they don't need to depart. You're going to feed them. Oh, hold on. Now, now I, I, I'm, I'm, I've looked at myself. I've examined. I don't have anything. I'm looking at my partners. We don't have anything. And you're going to have the audacity to say, don't send them away. You're going to feed them. Right. So let's see how Jesus operates. Right. And again, I believe this is another opportunity to see a, a gift of the Holy Spirit working. Again, I reference word of wisdom right here is miracles. Right. So you're going to see this gift of miracles. Right. It is a transferring, a transferring of miracles. Right. Also, it, you can look at the gift of faith. Right. And a great example is the disciple walking on water. Right. Jesus is transferring that faith temporarily for that thing is a gift of faith. Does that make sense? So you're going to see again this gift of faith right that he is giving to the disciples because obviously this is like man i don't even know what to even think about this but it's again this gift of faith is operating in this scenario again you prove it test it for yourself and see but i'm just trying to let you see it the way that I, that's been revealed to me he says again give ye to them to eat and they say unto him we have here but five loaves and two fishes he said bring them hither to me 
Isn't that a powerful thing? And it says, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes, looking up into heaven. And what did he do? Said he blessed it. Powerful, right? And then he broke it, right? Blessed it and broke it. And then he says what? He gave to his disciples. Isn't that a powerful thing to see how this function? Because what did he say? He says, you feed them. You give them to eat. So he blessed it and broke it. Didn't say he walked around to the people sitting in groups of 50. Mm -mm. Never said he walked anywhere. He's sitting right where he's at, blessed it, broke it, put it in the hands of the disciple. And it's a powerful thing to understand, to see that their participation in this miracle, again, it's that delegated authority, not just for uh, faith, right? Not just for miracles, but the delegated authority of this the responsibility of stewardship. You feed them, right? Isn't that powerful? And the disciples... Uh, to the multitude. So he blessed it, break it, gave to the disciples, and they gave the disciples gave it to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children, right? Thousands of people. Okay. Does somebody have a comment or a question, something you, you'd like to, to say? Okay, I see Emerson. He had to. Uh, I guess he had to step off here. A anything that you had to you had to say? No, I don't have anything. Okay, so so Brother G had to uh, had to get out of there. No, no big no big deal. Brother Greg G says, uh, "Good word. Apologize. I have to go. Father's blessings. Shalom." Okay, so powerful thing. So just continue it on. Okay, again, we're gonna we're gonna finish up uh, right in this area here. Here are some of my notes. Okay. I asked, what was the problem? Okay, so look at what's going on. Again, Jesus Christ solves problems the way that that is, is I would say it's very unique, <laughs> right, to, to, to anybody, even people that have followed God and read the Torah and prophets and all those types of things, very unique. Here's the problem. There is no food. That's the problem. So was Jesus effective, effective at providing a solution? Ask yourself that question. Was he? Okay. Was the problem solved? And the next question is, was Jesus efficient? OK, did everyone have enough food to eat? Absolutely. Right. According to the word. Right. Absolutely. They had more than enough. Everybody had had been full. All right. So they had plenty to eat. So I say, yes. Was there any waste? Now, again, when we look at this, this is crazy to think about a man that owns all Jesus Christ owns it all. And it's like, why would you find it necessary to have the disciples? go and to gather the, re the, the the remnants of the food. It's like, you can just go make some more, right? That's the mindset that we would have a very wasteful mindset, but Jesus don't have that mindset. Why? Powerful, perfect steward. He says no. So, so there is no waste. So my question is, how many baskets of food were left over after everyone had ate? 12, according to this one, right? Because Jesus did the same thing again. But in this example, it's a powerful thing to say, hold on. You tell me that all these people ate. Now, don't forget this. See what's going on. Jesus blessed it. He break it, put it in the hands of the disciples. They went to go feed the people, right? Gave it to the people, said they were all full. And then after it was all left over, said they grabbed 12 baskets of food that was left over. Now, here's the thing. It's unique. Now, we can assume that Jesus ate with the people. We can assume that. It doesn't say it, but we can assume it. And we can assume that the disciples actually sat down and ate with the people. We can assume that, it, but it doesn't say it, say it. So then my question is, OK, because, again, this is powerful when we understand that there is no waste. Everything is efficient, effective. How many disciples were there or how many apostles were there? Right. Many disciples. But how many apostles? <laughs> right. Twelve. <laughs> Do you see that? Isn't that a powerful thing? Do you think that's ironic or happenstance, right, that you happen to have 12 baskets and happen to be 12 disciples? So I truly believe this is a, a, another powerful model of stewardship. So when we're praying our Father, right, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and we say our bread, give us our bread, right, give us our daily bread, then it's a powerful thing to understand the kingdom perspective on it, that Jesus is taking care of the needs of the people, knowing that his needs are going to be taken care of. Isn't that faith? Right, to, to know that you can pray and intercede for the needs of someone else and know that God is a God that's benevolent enough that whatever's left over is going to be more than enough for you and for yours. 
Does that make sense? So I truly believe that the disciples had the miracle work in their hand and what was left over was there is the key, right? Because they had families. Many of them had had families to take care of and all those types of things. Even if they didn't take it to their families, then it was plenty for the disciple to be able to take to, to eat after all the other people were fed. Does that make sense? Again, no waste. Very efficient. When we understand how Jesus works again, was Jesus efficient? We have our perfect model for everything, including stewardship in God's kingdom. OK, so here are some laws. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. OK. Go to Matthew chapter seven, verse verses seven through eight. OK, again, these are principles. These are laws that Jesus Christ establishes. And it reads, ask. And it shall be given as a promise. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Do we see that? Okay. And my note is asking, seeking, and knocking are not only a law in God's kingdom, it is a command. <laughs> Do we see that? Jesus is commanding us to ask, seek, and knock. He wants us to do. He wants us to desire what he has to offer. So he wants us to come to him asking, seeking, and knocking. We were commanded to ask, seek, and knock. Do we see that? Okay. Now look at John chapter 14. Look at verses 13 through 14. Here's how it reads. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the father may be glorified in the son if ye shall ask anything in my name i will do it right again not a brand new scripture right but what i'm saying is is that we should should, should seek to adjust and i have our desire aligned with the desire of god god said it is my desire to give you the kingdom says what the father said the father says my good pleasure to give you the kingdom ain't that what he said so that's his great desire but is that our great desire jesus christ says in matthew 6 and 33 seek first as a command the kingdom of god and all of his righteousness then the promise can be added that all these things will be added unto you we shouldn't have no question what our aim should be right what our focus should be what our greatest desire should be so my question is, looking at this principle, how often have we asked, knocked, and sought the correct thing from God, right? So my note is, we ask in alignment with the will of our Heavenly Father. That's the way this principle is supposed to work. Not for all abstract, all kinds of wonderful things that we think that we need, that we don't need, right? Hindrance and weights to us. But we ask in according to the will of our Heavenly Father. Is being a wise and a faithful steward in the will of God is my question. Pay attention to what I'm saying. So we ask in alignment with the will of our Heavenly Father. So I'm asking you, do you believe that it's in the will of God, in the will of our King, for us to be wise and faithful stewards? Is it in the will of God? I'm saying, of course it is, right? Because Jesus Christ established it. So let's look at, at Luke uh 12 and 42 again and also matthew uh, 24 and 45 to end this thing out okay again paying close attention and, and the lord said who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season and in matthew 24 and 45 and who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Okay, so here's my note. Okay, so to so pay close attention, effective and efficient stewardship is God's will for all his children, not beginning in Jesus Christ, right? And we've established going all the way back to the beginning in Adam that this is God's desire, right? It is God's desire for all of his children. The question is, is it your desire? Does that make sense? Is that our will, right? Is that your will? Is that our will? Okay. I am suggesting that we begin sowing our time and attention into petitioning God to help us walk 
in his wisdom, right? To petition God to help us align with his idea of faithfulness, not our own, right? He's established what, established what faithfulness is and the idea of faithfulness, my question is, will I ask him to help me align with his ideal of faithfulness, right? Will I petition God to help me become the steward that he will and equip me to be? Will I do it? Again, if I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking, if I know that I can ask anything in Jesus' name and he will do it, am I going to ask for that? Can you help me with this stewardship reality? Can you help me identify myself the way that you see me, right? Can you help me see myself as a steward that you've already made me to be, right? Stewards own nothing. Oh, hard, right? Tough pill for me to swallow. But the more I say it, the more comfort I have in it because I'm resting in my dependence on God. Again, I'm growing in dependence, not independence. Mm -mm. The problem is, is that we had independence. I don't want no independence. I'm good on that. My goal is to grow in greater levels of dependence. And a part, as a part of that, I don't need to own anything. Forsake it all, right? All belongs to him, right? I am a steward of his things. So again, stewards own nothing. We own nothing. And that's something you may want to look yourself in the mirror multiple times during the day and begin to say, accept that because whether you agree with it or not, it is a truth. Whether you believe it or not, it's the truth that doesn't make it different or change it just because we don't believe it. So the quicker we can align with the truth, the more benefit that we can have and the faster that benefit can manifest in our lives. So again, stewards own nothing. We own nothing, yet we have been given access to everything. Isn't that a powerful thing, right? We own nothing in this world, yet we abide in the one who owns everything right and everywhere do you see that okay we are his stewards on this planet earth and in his kingdom do you understand that that is our right that is our responsibility that is our role that is our function and the sooner we come to grips with that and ask the holy spirit to help us in that and with that then the, then the better our experience is going to be with god so i'm done i really truly appreciate your time Again, I suggest that you go back through, pause, right, rewind, get your Bible out, take some notes in your journal, ask the Holy Spirit, I need some help to make sure that you can help me see this thing the way you want me to see it, not the way Corey wants me to see it, but how do you want me to see this, right? Help me to see through the lenses that you want me to see. If you don't believe that the context is the kingdom of God, ask the Holy Spirit, prove it out in Scripture right? If you don't believe that Jesus Christ has a perspective that is God's perspective, right? That the doctrines of Jesus Christ are the doctrines of God and that he is establishing commands and commandments because he is expecting those things to be our foundational things to build on. Prove it out, right? Ask the Holy Spirit, prove it out in scripture, right? But when you're done with that, again, whatever the Holy Spirit reveals and what you find, roll with it, right? Don't fight against it. Walk in it, right? And, and, and allow that process to begin to take place and allow it to be what it needs to be, right? Don't try to compare your experience with somebody else, right? Could be, you know, three months before you really see a, 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 a what is it called? A, 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 a huge amount of, of experience and change. Could be, you know, a week for some people, right? For some people, as soon as I believe I receive, right? Everything begins to, to, to change right at that moment. For other people, it could be a little bit longer, right? As they begin to have these, these doctrinal things worked out, these religious ways worked out may take a little bit longer, right? Unbelief and doubt could be really heavy on the inside of you concerning different areas of your life. No big deal. Stay in it. Keep your aim on Jesus Christ. Get focused on what Jesus Christ is actually saying. Be able to say, God, your kingdom is for me. I am your great king, uh, citizen of your great kingdom. Allow your kingdom to be revealed to me. Allow me to see your kingdom, right? Allow me to enter into your kingdom, right? powerful thing to understand when jesus gives his first command repent <laughs> why because the kingdom of heaven is at hand a lot of us need to repent say god my bad right i apologize for all my religious wrong thinking i apologize for my wrong ideas i apologize for for my rebellion i forgive me right i am turning from my ways holy spirit help me turn from my ways and turn to the kingdom of god right help me to convert right Holy Ghost, help me. Father, open my eyes so that I can see, right? 
Open my ears so I can hear. Allow this heart to be sharp so that I can perceive and understand what it is that Jesus Christ has been conveying in his ministry. And at the moment that we can see and hear and perceive, at that moment, then we can be converted, ask and desire to be converted and to convert to the kingdom of God. Right. I'm talking to people that's confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Talking to people that are in all types of uh, witchcraft and Satanistic types of things and all type of occults, uh, all of that. Everybody, everybody has to have the same experience, which is to be able to what? Repent because <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Convert to the kingdom of God. Why? Because when we do that, Jesus Christ says now he has permission to do what? Heal you. Right. And to forgive you of your sins. I'm not making this stuff up. Right. You can look at Matthew's account of the parable of the sower and Jesus Christ says those exact words. Right. So I'm saying to you, healing is available for you. Liberty is available for you. Right. Peace and joy are available for you. Right. It's there for the taking. And God has stored it up in, in grace or by grace and expects us to access it by faith. Right. That is our right and our responsibility. And we expect that to happen. So I'm thankful again for the time tonight. I look forward to seeing you on another reunited. Remember, our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. Again, remember that you should be asking. I should be asking and seeking and knocking. Right. Ask God help me to identify myself as a steward. God help me to grow in this wisdom that you have established and provided for me. Help me to be found wise. Let that be a characteristic working in your kingdom. Help me to have this faithfulness to be able to manifest in my life, right? Help me with that. Show me what that is, right? And I guarantee that if we have that pursuit and we're willing to, unwilling to live without it, right? As long as we're willing to live without it, we will. But at the moment that we're, we're, we're unwilling to live without it, then things begin to change our life. So have a great night. Look forward to seeing you on another Reunited.